Welcome to EPG Patshala. I'm Dr. Swati Biswas from the Department of Islamic History and Culture, University of Calcutta. Today we are going to discuss from the paper Economic History of India, the module Mughal Empire, Taxation and Agrarian Relations. In our earlier modules, we have discussed how agriculture flourished during the Mughal period. Now, in this module, we are going to discuss as to how the tax was appropriated or rather the surplus was uh, appropriated in the form of tax by the Mughal rulers. And in this module, our objective would be to learn the elaborate tax system of the Mughals, the evolution of the tax system from the preliminary Dahasala system to the elaborate Zab system and the relation of the taxpayers with each other and the state. Now the taxation system we have to understand encompass the whole of the surplus production during the Mughal era. Uh, the land in the medieval period belonged to the ruler so he could ask for any amount of rate which he himself fixed. The 18th century Kharaz was therefore not an Islamic tax and it exceeded more than the 50% mark by all means. Now, the Mal Kharaz was a term that was used for the tax on crop. Mal was thus a claim on behalf of the state to share the actual crop. In the primitive form, it was known in Hindi as Bhauli or Batai or Ghala Bakshi in Persian. In both these measures, the crop the, the divided into shares of the producers and the state. So basically it was a kind of a concept of crop sharing between the peasant and the state. Now this system was first called Kankut. It was multiplied by the total area cultivated under a particular crop to obtain the total produce of the crop. The quantity claim then be fixed according to the proportion the tax was supposed to bear to the produce. The rye or the yield was calculated by cutting the portion of the crop from three types of land that is good, bad and needling. The measurement of the land could be done at any time from the time of sowing to the time of harvest. This led to the change, first change in the hands of Sher Shah in 1540-45. So we must understand that before the Mughals started their tax system, a tax system prevailed which was to some extent modified by Sher Shah in certain parts of North India. Instead of the yield being fixed at the time of harvest, a standard schedule was now introduced to be applied to the sown area irrespective of the actual harvest. Abul Fazal informs that the schedule gave the high, medium and no, low yields of each crop so the state could fix the rate accordingly. The Kankut system went for a proper measurement system which then came to be called Zapt. The assessor could tell the peasant as what the state share would be. In case of crop failure, the land was declared Nabud or cropless and remit the tax as per schedule again. The rates if converted into cash were called Dastur ul Amal. In 1565-66, the measurement changed and the revenue in different areas became more and more realistic. Now, Akbar understood that for an empire building process, the tax system had to be in its proper shape. Moreover, at this point of time, we also have to understand that he divided the revenue department and he took it out from the military department. So they were both two different departments and the revenue department only looked after tax collection and tax distribution. So it was primarily the responsibility of this department to get into the rule book. In 1574-75, tax system was again much changed. It was based 
from the count that started in 1565-66. The revenue rates were freshly worked out. For 10 years from 1570-71 to 80-81, information was gathered for yield, prices and the area cultivated. On the basis of this information, cash rates were determined for each kind of crop in different places. The area of Lahore, Multan, Ajmer, Delhi, Agra, Malwa, Allahabad and Awad were divided into revenue circles and each had a separate rate for crops and cash. The rates fixed could be applied every year without much hassle for the state. There was no provision for revision of course. The ZAP system in its final form simplified the process of assessment. The classical ZAP system of course involved an annual measurement. Honestly, this was a, something that was not possible or feasible in a land like India with so much of diversity and uh, on a, such a large scale. This system was avoided therefore both by the state and the taxpayers. This acceptance for the purpose of current assessment of our previously determined uh, crop rate was therefore called NASAK. The ZAP system covered the whole area from Indus to Ghagra. Later during Shah Jahan's period it covered large part of Dakkan with the help of Murshid Kuli Khan. In the Dakkan Initially, kankut or crop sharing was introduced. Then crash rates or dastur ul amal was calculated. But it could only operate when the Mughals controlled Dakkan. The Zabt system did not cover the whole area. In Ajmer, in the district of Rajasthan, Ghallabakshi or crop sharing was prevalent. And Jinsi, which is a primitive means of tax collection, also operated in Rajasthan. So therefore, the system had its own flexibility, otherwise it would have not have worked so well. In certain parts of Kashmir and Sindh, crop sharing was also prevalent. In the 17th century, large part of Gujarat did away with the measurement system and again went back to crop system. But it depended on the course of agriculture, dislocation of agriculture due to famine or any other natural calamity or uh, peasant rebellion, therefore allowed the system to go back to its older uh, tax system. In Bengal, there was lump sum demand of cash from the entire village. The, this fixed rate of demand was known as muktai. Sometime revision or enhancement was also done uh, and that was of course reported in the rule book. There were other rural taxes known as jihad, seri jihad, furuat, and abwab. So therefore it is not only the tax on the crops that was levied but there were other rural taxes which the peasants had to pay. These taxes differed regionally. The taxes differed regionally and these taxes could amount up to 25 percent of the land revenue. So therefore the collective tax on land uh, on, on, on crops and the other taxes amounted to a great amount and it was definitely a regressive measure on the peasants. Now there is another issue which needs to be discussed here which that is Jizya and Aurangzeb. It has sometimes appeared as a controversial issue in the course of medieval history. We have to understand that jizya as a tax was abolished by Akbar formally. But again jizya as levied by the rulers was a kind of a rural tax that was taken from the non-Muslims. Aurangzeb imposed the jizya in 1679 as an additional burden. At this point of time the state was facing a huge financial crisis. It was technically 4% of the revenue, but in reality, it depended on the agent who collected it. In reality, this amount could go up 
to a month's wage of an unskilled laborer, and that, that was thus, therefore very high in the contemporary terms. Now, what happened if the crops failed? Now, in case of crop failure, adjustments could be made. Nabut or non-cultivated area would not exceed 12%. The Takavi or agricultural loan was granted. We have to understand the history of Takavi goes back to the time of Mohammed bin Toglak during Delhi Sultanate. The loan was repaid after harvest. So therefore, Takavi was always a pre-harvest loan. Low revenue rate was granted to encourage cultivation of wasteland. Within five years, of course, the maximum tax was excavated. Now, tax essentially, we have to understand, was collected in the form of cash because that was convenient for the tax collectors to handle. The system insisted, therefore, on collection in, in cash. There are certain areas in Bengal that the tax demand has always been in cash. So therefore, uh, the areas which were remote occurred to the center, the center always preferred the transaction in cash. Even in areas where Kankut or Bhauli was pre uh, prevalent, the tax was converted to cash. So the crop was collected in the form of kind and then it was sold in the market and converted in cash rate. In some remote places in Kashmir and Odisha, tax was collected in cash as well. Now, the state attempted to go for individual tax collection or asamivar instead of lump sum connection from the intermediaries, but it was impossible at times. In real estimation, the village was the unit and the intermediaries were the collectors. But this is a system which is very age old and even the peasants were somehow adjusted to the system. But the attempt of the center had always been to build a direct relation with the taxpayer. An estimate showed that Zamindars in northern India was granted 10%, in Gujarat 20% and the headman in the village was roughly allotted 2.5% of the land because as a, as, a, as a collected amount for the rate of their collection. The collection of tax involved severe methods. Non-payment of revenue was considered as a rebellion. Eviction was also done in some cases. In most cases, the headmen used torture tactics or imprisonment of the adult male and enslavement of women and children. So therefore, non-payment of tax during medieval period and the Mughal period in particular was not very, very congenial for the peasants at all. Interestingly, the tax system was had its own lacuna. Like any other tax system, the tax system had to operate on a uniform basis over a large area. And this was impossible because down from the line of the rule book, the intermediaries were there in different stages. The big landholders paid less tax as hereditary local heads traditionally in India. No system could alter this. So they were holding more land and paying less tax. So whenever there was an increase in the demand of the state, it was always the peasantry who had to pay more. The tax was levied on crop and the consideration of the size of the land holding was not ignored. So when a big landholder held a larger amount of land and got greater amount of surplus, the extraction from a smaller peasant and a larger pe or a big peasant always remained the same and it, at times even the rural leaders paid much less. Anyone with less land holding could incur less income but had to pay the same tax on the crop that is grown. So this, this, this system itself had its own drawback. The tax system was very regressive for the poor. 
The differentiation increase at the tax payment was done in cash mode. So the peasants to repay the tax immediately had to sell off their produce and as a result they did not get the high market price which they would have otherwise got if they could have sold it at a convenient time of the market. The peasants growing crash crop had better market hold than growing coarser groins of course. The crash crop, the demand of the crash crops of course uh, increased with time and therefore the peasants who were dealing with cash uh, crops had a better opportunity to keep certain amount of surplus with them. The tax system invariably increased the gap between the rich and the poor therefore. So the tax system which in a rule book could uh, in, a, in a rule book could uh, s seems to be perfect but in reality the tax system definitely had a bigger burden on the peasantry. Now it is the interesting to note the relationship of the state and the taxpayers. Now in this, uh, in this section we are going to discuss whether the taxpayer uh, and the state had deferred their uh, relationship compared to the earlier period. Now let us move to the concept of Jagirdas. Technically the sole tax collector was the emperor. In reality the specific areas or Jagis where the land was divided into the tax paying units was granted to a group of ruling elite who hold uh, held rather mansabs or military posts. Each member of the ruling class was assigned a salary in lieu of the rank that was a numerical count. Now the salary was usually assigned in the form of collection of land revenue from a particular piece of land or jaggi. So a salary would be converted into a revenue price and then it would be assigned to a particular land. These standing estimates of the average annual income from the taxes were known as Jama or Jamadami were prepared for the administrative division down to the villages as to ensure the correct amount assigned to the Jagir. The land was not assigned as Jagir uh, was the Khalisa land. Now Khalisa land is an area from where direct tax would go to the state. The tax from this area was collected by the state for its expenditure and of course the size of the Khalisa varied from time to time. During the period of Akbar it was accounted to about 25% of the total Jama at least in three provinces. During Jahangir this amount fell to 1 20th in the whole empire. Shah Jahan again raised this amount to 1 7th. So it depended on how and when the center would convert the lands into Khalisa land. Of course, the process was not very easy. Interestingly, the rural tax included the bulk of the GNP of the empire and that was in the hand of a small group of elites. So the producers were the whole, uh, the, the lower rung of the peasantry and the surplus, uh, surplus would, or rather extractors were definitely one small group. The social and economic importance of this class can be therefore envisaged. Now let us look into one of the accounts. The total mansab holders or the class of eligible Jagirdas was not more than 8,000 in 1642. A very small portion of the mansab holders were zamindars such as Rajputs, Baluch and Ghakkar chiefs. The others were therefore the direct people who were into the military service. The large amount of these Mansav holders were again immigrants. A small group of local intelligentsia and petty bureaucrats were also Mansav holders. Though not technically hereditary, but yet it tried to become hereditary in uh, most of the cases. 
Now, the ruling class enjoyed a lot of privileges, but they were always at the discretion of the ruler. This, this is a difference between the Jagirdas of North India and South India. The Jagirdas were always assigned a Jagir, which would be immediately taken away by the ruler. Imparting of the Jagir was always temporary in nature, the, therefore at least in North India during the imperial rule of the Mughals. The Mansab holder was entitled a Jagir and not the land which could be different in different years. So the working of it was very complicated and elaborate but it was essentially the working of the Mansabdari system. So a Mansab holder could be allotted a Jagir in one place in one year and then could be shifted to another Jagir in another year. Promotions, demotions and transfers also necessarily had to be adjusted in this system. The shift involved a whole lot of people. Now, thus in order to keep contiguous areas in Jagir with the Jama exactly equal to the Talab, transfers had to be made all the time now this would also this was also done to keep the system transparent but of course we have to understand as the empire grew this system became more and more complicated the jagis were transferred yearly or in every uh, year two or three years as an estimate shows in the records now what were the powers of the jagirdas there was no permanent right over the assignment. His claim was confined only to land revenue and taxes. He could only demand the taxes authorized by the state without any judicial power. He always had to leave papers with the Kanungos or the local accountant. It is estimated that in 1646, 68 nobles and princes claimed 36.6% of the Jama of the empire. So we can understand that a very, very niche group of people were actually controlling the surplus through this Jakidari system. The next 587 officials came, uh, claimed about 25%. On the other hand, the remaining 7,555 mansabs claimed a quarter of one third of the Jama. So the cash salaried people were much, much less. Jagir essentially was in the hand of few compared to the size of the empire. The bigger Jagirdas had military forces. So the fact that they could not become uh, uh, coercive is not true. And they always were uh, in an antagonistic uh, relationship with the local rulers or lo local leaders. The Jagidat could confront uh, anyone and even the turn the peasants into serfs. And there were many inferences of this happening. And the center in this way could not even control an inch. The Jagirdas did not remain in one place for long. He did not have any regard for the revenue collection and wanted to exact the maximum. Now, this attitude itself complicated the situation because they did not have any attachment with the peasants or the area. Thus, their aim was to maximize their gain. The authority tried level best to control them, but the effort definitely remained less effective. The Jagidar was always in conflict with the Zamindar and the peasantry. There was another privileged caste who enjoyed the tax from the granted piece of land known as madad e mash This group of small and usually were the religious inclinations of women of high rank. The kind of land in Subha Agra in uh, 1595 would comprise about 4% or 5% of Madadi Marsh. So Madadi Marsh lands were not very high. Now let's move to another group of um, landholders or, or right, land right holders, the Zamindars. Now the Zamindar as a term became popular from the Mughal time and uh, it became a kind of a club term for all the uh, earlier rural uh, leaders or stakeholders in the rural area. 
The term is Persian, of course, and indicates the holder of a land or zameen. In the 14th century, the term indicated the chief of a territory. During Akbar's period, it became a term indicating hereditary claim of a person over the produce of the peasants. So this is the basic difference between a Jagirdar and a Zamindar. The Jagirdar was not a hereditary post, while the Zamindar was more complicated as it had a kind of a hereditary claim. Zamindar was a, a blanket term for courts and Mukaddams in Doar, Doam, the Satahari and the Biswi Nawad, Bhumi in Rajasthan, Bant or Bhant in Gujarat. It also encompassed the term Milkiyat or Arabic term for the ownership. The Mughals treated them same but the regional variation of course was there. There uh, were of course some common features among all these group of people. All this group had the right to saleability or obligation to pay revenue as application applicable in case of all rights that bore common designation. So any zamindar could sell his right. Traditionally, they could impose a claim over and above the land revenue from the peasants and other villages. They even could levy imposts on forests or water which was known as Bankar or Jalkar respectively. The claim was initially different from the land revenue but the system imposed by Akbar blurred the difference. So the claim made by the state and the claim made by the zamindar was not very clear to the peasant adding on to their problems. In Bengal he was a sole collector of revenue from the peasant. In other parts of the state, he collected the revenue and received 10% of it in the form of cash or revenue free land. His due was called Malikana. So the term itself deters that the, he was the sole controller of the peasant life. In Gujarat, it went up to 25%. In reality, they earned much, much more that was assigned to them. They were credited for settling a village or distributing land among them. But again, they all were also uh, in a position to evict them at a will. So at the, the control of the village remained in the hands of these hereditary zamindars. The zamindari ride had clan and class inclination in a caste-based society like India. The zamindars were semi-military semi class in most areas and enjoyed the class clan tie with the peasantry and thus could not be ignored by any political authority. And at times they could even uh, give a leadership to peasant upheaval if they wanted to. The zamindari right was an invariably hereditary right we have to understand and therefore the attachment of the zamindar to the peasant and the land was always an established fact. So this is where they differed from the Jagirdars. The rights could be sold and divided among the successors of course which was done in the coming years. This indicates that the monetization of the time, so anybody who could wanted to sell his zamindari ride could do so. Property could be mortgaged to professional money, lead, money lenders. All villages did not of course have zamindars. The expansion of cultivation created new zamindars in certain areas. So the local leaders who could control the peasant became the zamindars. So this is basically a difference between the Jagirdar and the zamindar. Now let us move to a very vital issue who were the taxpayers, uh, how, what kind of a relation did they have with the state that is the village community and the state. We have to understand uh, that the village community was not disturbed as far as its structure is concerned. There was no difference between the peasants and the laborers as the misery was immense for both as observed by Bernier. So anybody who possessed a land did not give him any edge over a person who did not possess a land because possessing a land would mean giving a, reg a regressive 
tax to the state and then could be pauperized at any point of time. The village community was horizontally divided into village units self-sufficient and left to its own device by the despotic regime of the court so long as the heavy land tax was paid. The village community was itself complex in its com uh, composition. We have to understand most of the villages were within the Hindu, uh, Hindu religion, uh, caste, class, clan uh, component. The large peasantry could employ laborers in their land. On the other hand, there were the small peasants who could hardly produce the subsistence. So the difference between the, la the big landholders and the small landholders have always been very wide. Added to this was a caste-driven menial class who was traditionally landless and served as the reserve for supporting peasant agriculture. One group of peasants used higher laborers and claimed the harvest while the other group also claimed the crop after harvest. Once the harvest was removed, the claim was upon the crop and not on the land. The peasant could shift the fields and thus a big group of Paikash peasant was there. The peasant land holding was dependent about the social status and caste position. The bigger landholders paid less tax compared to the smaller ones who were low in caste position. The Pai caste peasants usually came from the lower caste peasant class rung. The monetization was a not able to destroy the superior claim of the upper caste by any means. We have to understand that the village composition depended on the class uh, on the caste and class basics. The scientific measurement or any other progressive attempt on the part of the state, if any, do, did not tickle down to the traditional villages. The village community operated in its own means in the way they functioned for generations. The grant of tax always was passed on to the lower rung of the society. So therefore, in this module, we have discussed not only the tax system that, was, that had an evolutionary character from the time of Delhi Sultanate and to a very regularized order of a rule book by the imperial Mughals, and also the relationship of the taxpayers with the state and the intermediary tax collectors. Now, let us summarize as to what we have done in this module. Now, we have tried to grasp that the tax system in Mughal India attempted to maximize the income of the state through various means that suited their convenience. The upper echelon of the society, due to political importance and class caste position, enjoyed the tax benefit. The tax system was definitely regressive and pushed the peasantry to thrive on subsistence. The surplus was exacted by various means and the state failed to control the intermediaries. So, and the diverse nature of the traditional means of tax exaction also was the reason why the uniform tax system could not be levied. The relation of the taxpayers and the state was very complex and a small group always enjoyed the larger benefit of the tax system which failed to give any relief to the common man. Thank you for your patience listening and for further reference, go back to the e-text given along with the module. Thank you.